Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, switching from analog audio and video to IP workflows, why fix what isn't broken with Cameron O'Neill. My name is Michael Grandinetti and I'm a content marketing coordinator here at Harman. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenter and he will try to answer as many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our learning sessions workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as by visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I would like to introduce you to the presenter for today's webinar. Cameron O'Neill is a 20 year veteran in the event industry, having worked at the Sydney Opera House for Redell throughout Asia and now at Harman. Having designed and installed systems for live event halls and TV studios, he has also worked on international sporting events with global IP networks. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Cameron. G'day, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, Michael, and uh, pleased to meet all of you here. And uh, thank you for joining us from all those varied uh, time zones, you know, including Trinidad, which is just amazing. So today, look, I want to have a very sort of compact agenda here, but sort of dive into about three or four topics, very shallow, at a very shallow level, but then uh, sort of leave it open to the questions to see if we want to get a bit deeper. Uh, and if you did sign up to this using the link, you would have seen that the, the subtitle to this, switching from analog to IP workflows, uh, is why fix what isn't broken. Uh, what I want to do today is basically run through a lot of the case studies that I've worked on in the last few years, and also sort of explain why people have made that choice to switch from analog or from digital to IP workflows. So what are we going to talk about today? First up, I want to do a quick uh, history lesson, I guess, for, for most of us on the analog to digital transition, because uh, it wasn't actually that long ago that uh, analog was the only thing we did in the audio and video world. Um, then I want to go and actually have a quick look, you know, again, not too deep on this as to what is audio or video over IP. Um, then we're going to sort of look at the incremental advantages that came from the shift between analog to digital and then across to IP. And then I want to spend a session, uh, probably a lot of the time here on, you know, actually myth busting analog. I have a lot of people that, uh, especially in the audio world, especially in the production world will say, hey, you know, analog is great. It's the only thing we need. Why would we make things more complex than we actually have to? So I want to sort of go through and give you guys a bit of, uh, let's call it ammunition to sort of go back to them and, and, uh, and really peel the, uh, the layers off the analog. And then lastly, I'm going to have a, a, a brief look at some case studies where we think uh, that IP actually makes a bit of a difference. Uh, now it is a, as I said, it is a compact session. It's a, you know, it is a very strange time zone to do things in the Asian time zone. So if you do want to throw in a question at any time, do show it up. I have the, uh, the Q and A section open on my computer here, so I can have a look and I'll try and answer them as we go through. So don't be afraid. Right, so let's now focus on that first generation of change. Uh, that happened in the audio and to a certain extent video industry, which is moving from analog to digital. You know, this is something that happened in about the 1980s. And something that is a recurring theme in all of these generational changes is that the technology was invented decades ago. Then it moved into the, what I call the play outside, you know, the playback side of uh, the audio or the video. And it was only after the technology like hyper matured into a level where um, there was lower latencies that you could actually use it in the production side, you know, in the content creation side of the equation here. Digital audio has been around for, for a long time before 1980, uh, but it was only in, at about that time then the CDs really started taking, um, taking music in their stride and making it available to the people. And I think anyone who was around that time will see the, the quote unquote, death of vinyl in that period and the absolute insane amount of uh, investment that went into the music industry at that time. But it wasn't until about 20 years later uh, that you could have, that digital consoles got to the point where you could actually have a digital console and mix your show from it or make a recording from it. You know, the, there were in the late 80s, some of the initial Yamaha digital consoles. And I think Yamaha is probably, you know, as, as much as it's not a Harman brand, is one of those pioneers uh, in the digital console sense. Uh, and it wasn't until really about the, the early 2000s where you started getting, you know, guys like this, uh, the 
big beastie boy, the uh, BM1D, uh, or the Dolby Lake Contour, sorry, the Lake Contours, they weren't owned by Dolby at the time, that started pushing digital audio and digital processing into a live environment. The main difference there being that you needed to have low latency. You know, you, it's okay to play a CD back at any time and 10 seconds of latency isn't a problem. Uh, but obviously if you have anything more than 10 milliseconds worth of latency on a show, uh, you're gonna have a lot of issues in mixing that show. Now I'm sure a lot of people have seen uh, a picture like this before over here in terms of what digital actually is. But basically all we're doing is we're taking the red line of the analog signal and then we sample it at a certain number of times per second. And each one of those samples will give us a binary output based on where that uh, analog signal is in the path. Now this is what we call pulse cold, post cold modulation. And it's basically turning that analog wave into a number of uh, zero, ones and zeros at a really high frequency rate. So the frequency rates that we're usually sampling, so the distance between say this dot and this dot is 44,000 times a second or greater. Uh, you'll hear 44, 100 uh, and 16 bit uh, used as the CD audio quality. And when people talk about high res, they basically mean anything that's higher than that, um, which is usually about 20 bits and maybe 48K or 96K. What we do when we increase the bit depth is we're basically making more between here, between the zero and 15, we start going up into the millions, <laughs> depending on how big your bit depth is. And when we talk about sample rate, we're talking about how many times we sample that in a second. Now, the end result really is the same. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros. But when we start looking at the speed at which we can process audio and the even without thinking about computer processes, we have a lot of, well, let's call it spare time. You know, if we look at a high res PCM stream where we jack everything right up to the, uh, to the gills, we're only looking at about 2.3 megabits per second, which is about three kilo, 300 kilobytes per second. And all of us know that 300 kilobytes these days is much, much slower than any of our connections, whether it's you know, Wi-Fi or Ethernet or, or 3G even. So a slow connection can easily handle multiple channels of audio or have like, let's call it a, a time uh, gap between each samples where the computer or the device can actually handle other things. And one of the things that this let us do is we could then stick in a few extra bits worth of auxiliary data. So in, in AS3, what it's called is a subframe. This is the most standard form of uh, professional audio. Uh, the analog, uh, sorry, the, the consumer version of this is called uh, SPDIF, this, you know, Sony Panasonic Digital Interconnect format. And basically all that is is changing one digit here in the preamble. Now, we can fit in a few extra bits of data into that, uh, into that bit of audio that we're sending between one device and the other. And that allows you to do things uh, like this. Now this is an intercom panel. And the only connection between this and the frame is using uh, the AS3 connection, but we're able to put all of the things like the status lights or the names or the volume control onto that same signal. You can see this done with a lot of digital consoles as well, where you might have a digital snake between the console and the stage, uh, and you're able to contrain, control the gain stages of the mic preamps on stage by twisting a knob on your console. There's no additional cables. It's all actually contained within the audio stream. So it's allowing us to do more with our existing infrastructure. Another area where it helped is by miniaturizing a lot of the equipment that we needed to use. Now, with an analog signal, everything has to be processed with analog electronics. So that's a bunch of resistors, a bunch of capacitors, and a bunch of inductors, which are the main things. Yeah, a couple of transistors in there for, for, good, uh, for good measure. Now, if I look at a, an analog console here, like our Signature 22, I have a mic pre at the top, then I have my gain control, my phantom, I have my EQ, um, other auxiliary sends, and then I come down to my main fader and where I'm going to route it to. That channel strip there can't be changed. It can only handle the signal that's coming in here. And then over here on my output stage, I have my, my output effects. That can only handle what's going out there because there is a direct electrical connection between all those pots, that fader across there to a bus bar, which then comes out via the analog signal at the end. But with digital, all of these processing components, all of that processing is now just shuffling ones and zeros around. 
and that can be handled on a small uh, PCB. Um, uh, sorry, a, a small uh, IC chip, so that can be housed anywhere within the uh, within the device. And then this is like using your computer. You have a keyboard on your computer where you can type uh, type anything. Those keys can be sending things to your email program or to your word processor or to your PowerPoint. And that's effectively what we do down here with the digital console. A digital console, this channel strip now is not connected directly to any particular input, but in software, we decide where it's going to be connected to. Uh, to the point where we can even have this one trim pot here being the gain control or the pan or uh, you know the auxiliary sends. So the size difference here is quite uh, amazing when you think about it. In this relatively small footprint here, which is you know a very small format mixer, if we think about it, it's not even fifty centimeters wide, or I think what's that? That's about uh, eighteen inches or so. Uh, we've only got twenty two channels. Whereas down here, we haven't even doubled the width of the console. We've gone to you know, 84 centimeters, uh, but we've increased the channel count almost tenfold. And that's a really massive advantage when you, when you really sit down and think about it. You know, that's a lot more channels that we can get in there. So now let's have a quick look at audio over IP. So I call this a digital evolution. It's not really a revolution in a lot of ways. It's just basically taking what we knew from the digital world and then allowing us to transport it on a different method. The first thing I think to notice is that once audio is ones and zeros, it all looks exactly the same as any other bit of data. You know, that could be your, your JPEGs that you're sending around to, to send kids' photos to your parents or the emails that you're sending uh, or an IP phone call or uh, watching the stream, for example. The only thing is you can't just get a bit of digital audio and stick it in a network and hope that it's gonna work. It has to sit within the framework of the rest of uh, that network or what we call a packet. Um, now, a packet is kind of like the fundamental unit of all IP. So I wanna spend just a little bit of time on that and to distract us away from audio so that we don't get confused between the audio world and this, I wanna have a look at an email. Now, let's just say this morning I sent off an email to one of you guys on the, on the call. From my point of view, I just push the button and the email goes across to you. And then from your point of view, you just have an email arriving in your inbox. But what's actually happening when we do that? Well, the computer splits that email into a lot of little tinier chunks of data. So that data will now... Uh, look like any other ones and zeros. It can be encrypted, it could be email, it could be anything. But when your computer receives that data, if it was just to receive ones and zeros, it wouldn't know what to do. And if we think about even your Outlook program, it doesn't know which email it has to connect to. So the first thing we have to tell that data is attach a bit of information to it to say, which email does this relate to? Because we broke the email into chunks. Then we have to say, well, okay, is this actually, is this email gonna go to Outlook or is it gonna go to Gmail? Is it my private email? Is it my work email? I don't know. Before that, one step back, the computer needs to know what kind of data is this? Is it an email or is it a part of the stream that you're watching now? Then of course, to whom? If I'm sending an email out, I need to say, okay, this is from me uh, to Wang Chin, for example, who's sitting on the, on the chat. So pleased to see you there, Wang. Um, we need to know who it's actually going to. And then of course, there is the bigger information here about how to get there. From myself to say America, there's a lot of different ways between Japan and America in terms of the internet cabling. And then lastly, which cable am I going to use? The laptop I'm using today has got two ethernet ports, you know, a main and a backup, and it's got a Wi-Fi. So how's it going to get out of my computer? All of that information together is what we need to have a bit of information, that this bit of data, this yellow bit of data, to go through the network and to have every other device on the network understand what's going on and where to send those data. So we split this into two sections usually. We call this the header and then we have the rest of the data. Now that data, as we mentioned before, could be that part of the email that I sent before, or it could be a few of those samples from an audio packet uh, that we saw before. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but effectively now, instead of saying which email, now we're going to say which channel. Is this channel 17, the drums, or is this channel 15, the, the made lead vocals? And we could go down through each one of these headers and we would change the information that's in there 
which would then let any console or amplifier or vision mixer or whatever know where that data had to go. <clears throat> so now let's look at an actual IP packet. Now this is a, an AVB packet. We see down the bottom here, we have the original samples that we have that we had uh, in the digital audio stream. In fact, we can fit uh, multiple of those into one packet. So you'll see here it says sample N. There's usually uh, a few dozen packets, uh, sorry, samples within one packet. Now, each one of those samples, as we saw before, could contain some additional data. That could be channel information, that could be uh, gain control commands to a mic preamp. It could be uh, channel names that are going to be printed on the console or printed on the, uh, on the intercom system. Then we start sticking headers on there. We stick a bit of a header to say, hey, this is audio data, so don't treat it like an email. We have a timestamp to say where, they, where these packets sit within uh, the overall um, scheme of things time-wise, and I'll mention that a bit more in a moment. Then up the top here, we say, you know, what's the source and the destination address? Where is this coming from? Where is it going to? And then we have a few extra things in here. We have um, a, what's called a CRC check, which makes sure that it's all formatted properly. We have, you know, which type of data is it? Is it Ethernet or something? VLAN, which is a way of, excuse me, separating uh, packets within one network. But in general, you can see here, there's quite a lot that goes in behind uh, an IP packet when compared to a digital packet. Now, I'm sure a lot of you looked at that and probably more than half of you glazed over. Uh, and that's okay, to be honest, that's uh, those, those sections just there is usually about a one day or maybe even a two day training course. Um, and I'm happy to, <laughs> to help people on that. And I will put up some resources at the end so you'll be able to see those. Uh, but of course, it looks like a lot of work. Now, you'd have to say, most of us have done events. We have plugged things together, mic into mixer, mix into amp, amp to speaker, boom, done. That's an event. Why would I even bother doing this? Well, let's have a look at the advantages. Because I think each generation did bring advantages. If we start with analog, it is pretty easy. And you'll see a lot of these um, words that show up in marketing material about IP actually existed in the analog world. The first one here is interoperable. You know, in general, if you have a line level signal, you can plug it into any line level input and take any line level output into any other line level input and it's gonna work. You don't have to worry about if your mixer is a Yamaha and your amplifier is a crown amplifier going to JBL speakers. You don't have to care because it's analog, it just works. It's also very easy to follow the flow. Uh, one of the things I teach people when I talk about uh, either video or audio, um, I say you, you're basically working like a plumber. You have an input somewhere, which is usually a microphone or a camera. That signal is going to flow through a bunch of things and then it's going to come out at the other end. You know, if it goes in, it's going to come out somewhere or it's going to sink out somewhere. So it's very easy to sort of follow that flow because you really are taking them your hand down along the cable in, in effect and saying, okay, this cable plugs into there, this plug cable plugs into there. And the signal flow is, because of that, very easy to understand. If you've just shown up onto a site and the event is already set up, another audio engineer or video engineer could say, okay, here's your multi-core, this multi-core goes to that console, that goes to these amps, and then it goes out to the speaker. It's very easy and quick to explain what's going on there. So it sounds like a perfect world. So why would we even want to go up? Now, digital, we mentioned this a bit before. Um, the biggest, I think, difference is that you now have a lot more cable, uh, a lot more signals on one cable. Um, a MADI signal, for example, which is the standard in a lot of broadcast things, is um, uh, it can allows you to get 64 channels on a single coax cable. So instead of pulling a very heavy 48 or 64 core multi-core cable, which is you know, weighs a few kilos per meter, um, now you can just carry one BNC cable and connect big sections together. Um, there's also some systems like uh, Howman's Blue Link, which can do 256 channels on a single Cat5 cable. So when you think about the efficiencies there in both space and weight and cost, uh, you actually have quite a lot of, um, of advantages there. Another thing that's not quite obvious initially is the fault finding. Because we have those extra few bits of data in each uh, sample of audio, we could put um, some data there to say, hey, my device is working properly, or here's my status, I'm set to this clock speed, I've got this much power. You can put those bits of data into those uh, spare user bits and get that information back to you at a console. 
So instead of having to have a problem at your console, check your console, then walk to stage and check your, your preamp box on stage, you can get the data back and say, okay, no, the preamp box is working as it should be. The problem's probably here at my console. And then we mentioned this before, smaller and fewer devices. We spoke about the smaller, but the other thing that we can start doing is we can have fewer devices. And that's because in the past, where we used to have EQs, compressors, uh, and outboard equipment. All of that can now be done in software because we're just dealing with ones and zeros. So that uh, allows us to expand the amount of effects that you'd have on stage, but without having to carry around an extra truck's worth of equipment. And then I look at IP and I look at all the marketing. And I think if you would read any marketing material from anyone promoting IP, almost all of these points are covered in there. So the question becomes, what is the actual advantage of IP? I do see someone with their hand up in the uh, attendees area. So if you've just got a question, just pop it into the Q&A area and uh, we'll be able to see it there. Okay, so this is an analog patch panel. Um, I don't know if anyone on the, on the screen has seen this before, but it's from one of my previous uh, employees, <laughs> employers, I should say. Um, I'm not allowed to mention the name, but I think you could probably guess if you go through that list. So the first advantage of IP as compared to any uh, analog or digital is that it's what I call routable. Um, even with digital, if I want to connect my console to my amp rack, I need to have one cable going from one point to the other point. And if I wanted to then connect a second device into that area or a third device into that chain, I'd have to then cable between one or multiple of those devices and then have a router or a splitter to then split that signal out to that extra location. With IP though, as soon as a device is plugged into the network, it is able to get any signal that's on the network into and out of itself without actually interfering with any of the other equipment. So we really simplify our cabling here and then we can start working with network structures, which can also allow us to have good redundancy. Um, we do have a, a reduction of equipment between analog and digital, but I think between digital and IP, we have a huge reduction. Um, the reason for that is because we can completely do away with all patch phase whatsoever. So this monstrous thing over here, which is taller than a person, by the way, um, is completely gone. It's completely redundant. We did use this with some digital signals to a certain degree. Uh, but once you move all your patching to the software world with a routable system, you don't need to have any splitters, any converters or anything else. We do have a much greater fault tolerance as well. Even with a digital signal, you can run uh, backups and most, uh, most stage consoles will have like a main and a backup digital console, uh, a digital connection. But with an IP system, by default, the IP uh, standard is built to be fault tolerant. It's built to re uh, reroute connections. It's built uh, to basically get the connection between me and you guys running all the time. You know, we're covering a lot of countries here with this call and between me and you guys, there's almost certainly people that have accidentally turned off switches or cut cables or crashed a car into a telegraph pole and brought down a line. And apart from a minor glitch, you wouldn't even notice it. Another cool thing is that you are now able to inter interconnect other signals. Uh, you can basically eliminate or you know, uh, recompensate for your lip sync delay, which used to be a big problem in um, live AV events because within the data that's contained in the IP signal, there is a timing, timing portion, which we saw before. So every packet that's created knows where it sits in the overall timeline of the universe. And therefore an audio signal and a video signal that are, that are synchronized can be added together. And these, the devices themselves can automatically align those so that everything is in sync. We can also plug in say an HDMI from a laptop send the audio directly to the audio console and send the video to the projector or to the video guys, and then reroute, uh, reconnect them and retime them so that those systems are all in sync. And then we also have the broader part of this, which is the converged network and cabling. And I do see a lot of people who get very nervous about running systems that are on the same network, for example, your email and your um, <laughs> live audio system. But even without that, and I'll speak to that in a second, um, you can have, um, you can have um, 
your installer, instead of having to pull a bunch of ethernet cable for your IT cell infrastructure, and then pulling a bunch of analog cables with these weird connectors on here, uh, you can just say to one guy, okay, look, pull a dozen ethernet cables and I might use three or four of them. That greatly reduces cost. And to give you an idea of how much cost you're saving, um, and this is a very bad example, but each one of these connectors used to cost us about somewhere between 30 and $50. Um, I say between because we could never find them on the open market. You basically had to do spot buys whenever you could. Now that's a, that's a 32 by, I think it was 50 something uh, matrix. So it's, it's a good few hundred connectors there. So even without the cables, and you can see there's a lot of cables stuck behind there, um, you would <laughs> be putting a lot of cost into that. Whereas you could just charge a, a standard electrical contractor to put in some ethernet cables and you'd be done you know, with time for breakfast basically. And then the last thing is standardization. Um, I'll speak to this in a second when we talk about the myths, but once two devices are using the same protocol, in theory, uh, those two devices should be able to instantly um, translate data to between each other. And then just a quick word on the fault tolerance, you know, and I'll, I'll speak to this more in a second. We couldn't remove this board, and you'll find this a lot with analog things, is that everything is so fragile in the analog world. We couldn't repair this board, um, which is why in the end it ended up getting cut off. If you unscrewed the, the panel and moved it out to try and fix this one dead uh, line in the middle of the system, uh, you'd actually then unconnect, disconnect a dozen other cables. And so we had a general policy that um, what we did is we just marked lines dead. And you'll see that there's that one there, uh, there's that one over there, and then there's this whole section down here where we've actually tied off, I think, four or five lines. Okay, so let's now look at a real world example. Um, I believe I'm not supposed to mention the name of the venue, but I'm pretty sure that you could guess. Um, I have written an article on this uh, quite a few years ago, you can see, as I mentioned, this has been done for a while, 2012. Um, this is the system that we ended up installing in that venue. Uh, and you can see here that we did call it the Grandmaster LAN and it had everything. It had your office PCs, your VoIP telephones, a connection to the internet. Uh, we did have control laptops as well, but we did also have the theater comms. We had the PA hoists, we had the audio over IP and we had the DMX running all through that same LAN. It was a truly converged LAN. Um, now, of course, the big question is why on earth would you do that? Um, and to be honest, that question did take us about three years <laughs> to answer even internally. Uh, but the, the key thing was that as a large venue, the events were driving us that way. Uh, we had the APEC conference in 2007. Um, and I, I distinctly remember that the requirements of that conference compared to the normal theater shows that we were doing was so different that we didn't have the infrastructure to even do that. Uh, and we had to spend a lot of time. It was about two weeks, three weeks, maybe um, running in additional cables, putting in extra patch panels, um, temporary cabling all over the place. Um, and then also making sure it was hidden because we had world leaders running around. Um, and it was just really a pain. And then because the venue saw that they could handle these big conferences and multi-venue festivals, they said, well, you did it before. Why can't we just do it again? And IP was the only real answer there because uh, it was a very difficult place to run new cables. Uh, we also needed to save budget. And one thing that you know a lot of large venue pay, um, venue managers will know is that if you have a PA hoist or a, a motor system, you need to have an on-site person looking after that. You need to have an SLA. You need to have an SLA for your lighting guys. You need to have an SLA for your phone guys. Uh, the problem was that that was starting to get expensive because each system now had to have specialists on site 24 hours a day, just in case it went off. By moving everything onto a master LAN and then really training the heck out of my technicians, we could handle a lot of those calls just from our control laptops and they were wireless. So it didn't matter if you were sitting down and having lunch, if you got a call on your laptop, you could then try and start troubleshooting that system. And what really helped us is we could then take that laptop into the venue and say, okay, what's your problem? Okay, let me repatch this here. Let me try this thing here. And sitting in front of the director rather than going to the guy, hearing all these problems, running downstairs to the patch room, repatching everything, running back up and saying, does that work? You know, I, I quite often joke that probably the thing I've heard the most in the last 20 years is, you know, can you hear me now? Uh, working as eight years as a comms technician, we'll do that to you. And then the last thing here is increasing utilization. Uh, 
any rental company or any venue will tell you that the biggest problem that they have is utilization of their venue. And the reason for that is uh, I always think of a theater or a, a stadium like a, an airplane. You know, once the plane takes off, you can't sell that seat. It's very difficult to. And it's the same with a stadium or a theater. As soon as the curtain goes up, you can't sell that seat anymore. So the only way you can increase your profitability, you increase your uh, revenue is basically to, let's say, virtualize your seats and make it so you can increase the number of seats. And the way we do that was turnaround time. So we changed our turnaround time from about six hours down to two hours. Now that doesn't sound like a huge amount, but that is the difference between a symphony performance finishing at say 2 p.m. in the afternoon, turning around and getting the venue ready at six o'clock, which means a sound check at seven, which means that the show's not really gonna start until about nine or 10 p.m. Or now starting your sound check at about 4 p.m., opening the doors at seven for a normal size concert show. That makes a huge difference. Uh, this is one of the venues, and I just want to, to kind of point out the distances as well. I think um, sometimes we, we get a bit, um, let's say, distracted by the distances when we look at a small venue. Now, this venue in particular had a, uh, an opening of about 20 metres, you know, 60 feet. Uh, you would say, okay, 60 feet and then up to the speakers, that's not too far. Front of house is about, you know, again, 60 feet, 20 metres away. But the console was here. We had mics on here. We had an electroacoustic room over here for the national broadcaster who would broadcast every event. Then we had our acoustic room, which is the only place we could really store equipment. Then over here, we had an, a processing rack, which was where the processors for the front of house console would go. The amp rack itself had to be within 90 meters of the speakers. And then there was the winches as well, which took a lot of that distance. And this is some of the kit that we use. Now, 350 metres was the distance between that processing rack uh, next to the front of house console and the amp rack. And then the manufacturer said we could only have 90 metres between the amplifiers and the speakers. And you can imagine that if you have that winch there, this has to have 30 or 40 metres worth of slack on it. You're really limited by your distances here. And in the end, uh, IP or at least digital audio was the only way we could make this happen. And that's why we use the unfortunately now defunct Dolby Lake processors. Okay, so that's a, that's a quick, like I said, a very shallow dive into a very deep topic. Uh, but what I wanted to jump into now uh, was the myth busting part of this, because I usually go through those first two sections and I can spend 10 minutes or I can spend a day discussing those. And then usually I get some smart aleck up the back of the room, sticking his hand up and bringing up one of these points here. And I think the, the key here is, is what I've said on the, the tagline here. People decide not to make the change across into IP or they make the change not into digital. But I don't think those reasons are as good as people think they are. So let's look at the first one. The myth for me is that analog just works. And you'll hear this a dozen times. You know, people will just say, I just go into a venue, I plug everything in and it just works. You know, I don't need to find the guy that's the DSP guy. I don't need to go and connect the core or boot up the core, or reboot a switch. You know, all the signals are the same. I just don't need to think about it. I can go in there and make it work. Uh, and to that, I say, well, is that really true? Because I've done a lot of tech checks. You know, I've done a lot of sound checks um, and almost every single one of them there's like 15 minutes where you've got a buzz or a riz or a line that doesn't work. And you've got three guys chasing down that signal from the microphone to the patch, uh, to the multi-core, to the patch bay, to the console, to the amp, trying to work out where that problem is. Yeah. And as we saw before, you know, the patch panels are covered in tape. And then the other thing that you'll see is if you, I've, you know, the running joke with me is everyone I go into, I say, hey, can I, let's go have a look at your machine room. Let's go look at your patch panel. And the first thing they do before they open the door is they say, hey, look, it's a bit messy in there. Just, you know, it's not always like this. And that's a, that's a lie. It's always like that. You know, you have those do not remove patch cables, the one that gets the conductor view to the stage manager or the stage manager's mics to the prima donna's dressing room uh, or the sh talk to stage mic that you have from the front of house console to the, you know, the, the little Eon 15 you've got on the side there. You know, so if there's not that local knowledge person, you're going to be lost anyway. It doesn't matter if, you know, you don't have that DSP expert. And then let's not even talk about connectors. You know, as we saw before, those Limo connectors on that patch panel that were only used in that patch panel. But 
analog does have a bunch of different standards. You know, you have mic level, you have line level, you have different, you know, DBU levels on these, uh, on these signals. You know, I, I've seen people trying to put headphone amplifiers into line inputs. These things exist. And unless you know what you're doing, um, you're not going to have a great show. I mean, this is the entire reason that a DI box exists to get a guitar input into a line level input. So you can't just tell me you just plug everything together and you don't think about it. Then after that, there's myth number two, it's easier to fix. You know, I know what the problem is. I can go and find it. Well, yeah, you know, and once I find the problem, I know how to fix it. And I know all of these things. I don't need to go and find an IT guy to sort out, sort out my problems. You know, I can go to a site and I'm a green beret. I can fix everything. I don't need any help. But the reality of that is, I know I've done this a few times. You hear a buzz and you think, oh, it's probably something gone one-legged. And then you go down through the entire multi-core and you spend about an hour trying to find where that one-legged uh, bit of cable is, you know? And then after that, you actually go, oh, whoops, that wasn't what it was. It was just the guy left his amp on out in the back and someone had a microphone plugged into it, you know? Uh, but if I've got an IT system, I can see every point of that. And I'll come to an example of that in a moment. Yeah, and then the other things, I used to carry around a little gas-powered soldering iron, you know, and you'd crack open the multi-core and you'd retape something on, but then something else would break. And you go, you know what? It's just easy to put a bit of electrical tape on that, right busted, and then deal with it next time. Uh, but the problem is it might not have been that part of the chain that was busted and you end up with tape everywhere. And I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but, you know, one mic cable from mic to console is easy. But once you've got like a multi-core and a few stage boxes involved, you kind of in a bit of trouble there. It's you know, you've got 30, 40 meters, or if you're at a festival site, you could add like a hundred meters between yourself for the front of house position and the stage, you know, unless you've got a radio and a friend, you're not going to find that anytime quickly. And then there's this big one here. And this is the one that really gets me is because people say, you know, I don't need any training. I know how to do this. I've been doing it for years. Um, if I had to go I do, to IP, I'd have to learn it again. I'll have to pay thousands of dollars. And essentially, you know, learning new things is scary and I don't want to do that. Well, the reality is, so you did learn. No one is born and just ma you know magically picks up a uh, a mixer or a microphone and knows what they're doing. It's not. It's an acquired skill. It's not an innate skill. You know, it's just you probably did a lot of that job, uh, that training on the job. You went out and you did a you did some events. You saw how it worked. You learned off other people and you got there. And the other thing is, if you do that with i uh, if you do that with an IP system, you know the the signal flow doesn't necessarily change. You're still going mic, console, amp, speaker. It's just potentially through a different cable. So you're already halfway there. You know, just because the chain, the the way you're getting around the system changes, doesn't mean the rules have changed. You, know, you still need to be have a good ear and still know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, or, or good eye for in the video space. And a lot of IT engineers have also just learned things on the job. Yeah, there are certain things that, yes, require some degree of training, but it's not like everyone goes out and gets a, a computer science degree just because they want to be a network engineer. There are things you can learn by yourself through your own self-study. And I mean, if you really want to, you can go to a, do an SAE course or you can do a Bachelor of Sound Engineering. It's not like, it's not like the sound engineering is this secret cult that, that you can only get in through through, um, through 20 years of hard work. You know? And not everyone thinks learning new things are scary. And then the last one for me, really, which is that the analog systems are cheaper. And that kind of comes from people looking at uh, the cost of maybe one fiber cable or an ethernet cable and comparing that to a mic cable and saying, you know what, we don't need that. Or even a switch, uh, especially when we start talking about more high-end systems, you go, wow, that switch costs $5,000, $10,000. You know, I didn't need that in the days of analog, you know, and because the system is simpler, it's, it must be cheaper overall. You know, I only have to think about one type of connector and blah, blah, blah. And then if I converted my system as it is now into IP, all I'm really doing is sticking a switch between my microphones and my consoles and my amps. So that's just adding cost. Surely that, you know, it's just going to increase the price. Now, the reality on this one is a bit different. And I think that's because there is a scale factor here. In a small system, you may be right. If you've got your, let's call it the touring pub system where you have a bunch of guys on stage, one little mixer and an amplifier or even powered speakers, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that better with IP. But once you hit like a certain size of system, you know, about the 300, 400 seat theater, just the patch panels 
are going to cost you a lot more than the site than the cost of one or two switches. You know, as we saw before, that one patch panel with 600 or so connectors on it, each panel, each one of those connectors is going to cost, you know, 50 or so dollars. That's, that's a few thousand dollars there before you even think about actually paying someone to solder all those cables on. You know, and as the complexity increases, those simple systems basically need to have more and more um, connectors on there. You know, that patch panel, the part, a lot of those inputs and outputs there were actually dedicated just to mic splitters. So you plug a cable from the, the stage into the mic splitter, that would then give you three or four outputs for that, for that one signal, which you could then patch around to different areas. Now, the more areas you have, the more complex the system, you know, if you think about even just adding a, a broadcast system into a standard live event, you'd then have your front of house console, you'd have your monitors console front stage, and then you'd have your broadcast console. You'd have to then split each one of those signals three times. Whereas with an IP system, you just plug into the, the console into the network and you're on the network. You have access to all those signals without bugging people. And this last one I think is really the key here. A lot of systems that I've seen, people have started with the system that they have today or the system that they've designed in the last uh, venue that they worked in. And then they just jam some switches in the middle. And of course that is gonna cost more. Uh, it really does bug me when you copy that analog system or even a digital system across into the IP world, uh, neglecting the fact that you could do away with almost all patch panels and do everything on fiber or everything on cat five and then just have direct connections to the end equipment. Uh, that really does actually change the cost. And there was one uh, stadia we worked on in France that re reduced its cabling cost alone by about 30% just by switching everything to fiber. So now the, the promised land, the uh, couple of little case studies here. I um, want to sort of show you some areas where we have used IP and it did actually make a difference because I do think as much as I am a proponent for IP, I think that sometimes you can, you know, bring a bazooka to a knife fight. You can come in there and, and try and do too much with the IP things when really a simple analog solution would be more than enough. So number one for me is distance. Now I showed you the example before where we had a 350 meter run between the, um, between the processing racks and the amplifiers, uh, but that's, that's kind of easy mode for IP. Uh, Network protocols are designed to basically be infinitely repeatable and infinitely scalable. You know, we can get internet on the ISS for crying out loud. Um, you guys are watching from different countries. There's not a problem with the internet traffic getting long distances. Uh, and it's not just because we can repeat that data. It's also because the ethernet protocols have um, error correction, which basically allows you to lose an entire packet, but then rebuild it from the packets that are around it. Now it's obviously that's a gross simplification of how forward error, error correction works, uh, but definitely those are protocols that exist within the IP world. And digital systems can be replicated uh, again and again uh, without degradation. This is one thing that bugs me when people say they prefer to have vinyl. You know, every time you play a vinyl record, you know, you are degrading that signal. You know, maybe infinitesimally small, but you are changing that signal, which means the next time you listen to it, it will be a different signal. Um, Analog signals do have a limit here. And I think even with, let's say a digital signal, like an AES signal, uh, you can run into trouble if you're going even moderate distances. Uh, I do know certain systems that are AES3 that will say on the box that they can go 300 meters or hundred meters or so. Uh, but once you get a cable that's longer than say 50 meters, in a production environment where you have lots of RF being spat out from LED walls or from dimmer rooms or from power that's going to winch lines, uh, you get so much interference on that signal that even a digital signal and like an AES signal will get lost. Whereas IP, you go into fiber, you can go as far as you want, there's no problem. Now this is uh, this was during a commissioning of a system here and you can see that we had a link uh, between Darwin and Ultimo, and then eventually we did extend this um, this network out to Perth, which is about you know, three and a half thousand kilometers. Um, all of those systems there were, you know, they weren't real time because there was a speed of light effect at this length, but definitely they were fast enough that you would not notice that there was a difference between those systems. And those systems, because they had that error correction and because they had that extra data that we uh, that we talked about earlier, 
I could be sitting in Ultimo as I was at this time, and I could see the status of the entire country's network. So we could then eventually mesh all of these sites together. So it didn't matter, an entire site could go down or an entire line could be cut and the user would not even notice that, you know, that suddenly their signal instead of going directly from Ultimo to Darwin would go via say Perth and then get across to Darwin because that's how IP works. Another area where IP makes a difference is when you start getting really complex systems here. You know, it, it is possible to split an analog system a few times, but I, you know, I do have seen so many racks with, you know, distribution amplifiers, just video distribution amplifiers or analog distribution amplifiers, and you split it and you split it again and you split it again and you re-amplify and you split it again. Uh, but essentially, if you've got one stage box on stage, you might only have um, one gain stage or one input stage for that uh, video or audio signal. But if you've gone IP, one of the key differences, and this takes a bit of getting your head around, is that processing can now be done at the endpoint. Now with a mic signal, we have to turn that up pretty quickly um, because a, a mic signal itself is very weak compared to the rest of the signals that are around in the system. Uh, but with an IP system, as soon as it's digital, you can distribute that anywhere around the network, anywhere around the world, and then you do your processing at the endpoint. So if the broadcast guy wants to increase the gain, he can do that without infecting the guy at front of house or the guy at monitors. Uh, or if the stream broadcaster wants to have a certain color profile that's different to the, um, to the standard traditional media broadcaster, they can both change their color settings on the, on the camera without having to impact the others. It also allows you with a bit of, you know, clever control systems to have say a stage manager deciding what they're going to watch rather than having to call up the video engineer and saying, hey, can you route me the broadcast truck? Can you route me the conductor view now? They can just choose them themselves. Now, I mean, I think the other big area where this really makes a difference and I have seen this deployed quite well is esports venues. Uh, we have judges who have to watch five or six, well, actually, sorry, 10 screens, because that's two teams, uh, plus the void, the, cameras of the people who are actually doing the gaming, plus the audience, plus everything else. They need to be able to switch that in rapid succession, uh, but they need to do that without asking an audio guy uh, or, or a video guy. And these guys aren't natively engineers. And now this isn't technically a pure IP system, even though we were using it as a backbone with a lot of IP on it, but this is the G20 system in, in, um, in Brisbane. And because yeah, it was, all baseband, you know, it was digital signals, but no, not converted to IP. There was a lot of extra routing and such that we had to do right in the middle here, basically to make it all work. Now, those signals, that's just to get it all configured and to get it onto the same firmware. Uh, we actually had about six times the amount of cable there when the event went in. And then the last one here is the speed of change and flexibility. So this is quite common to rental companies that have to set up big events and don't have time or big venues that have that utilization problem. You know, if you think about a big stadium or arena show, they can take a week or so to set up and then might run for a few weeks just to make the money back. Now, if you could lower the amount of days that you have in the setup, you can actually really increase your, um, either both your revenue and your profit margins there. Now, companies also don't wanna pay full price to a rental company for any setup day for their equipment. Um, it's, it's ludicrous, basically. <laughs> you know, so any day that you can get the gear working and actually working on an event is going to increase uh, your, your ability to make money, basically. Now, IP really helps us in two ways. The first one is that there's the OSI model, which is where we talked about packets. And again, shallow dive into a deep topic. Um, a good thing about OSI is it's got a built-in layer structure. And if you know that a certain layer is working, then everything below that is definitely working. So if you have a layer three connection, you don't have to go and check the cables because you know the cables are working. No. Uh, and similarly, because there is, uh, you, you're getting rid of a lot of these sources of uh, error and interference, you don't have to necessarily uh, check things once you've got them out of the factory. You can build it in the factory, configure it, and then ship it out. And then the other thing is that you can do changes in configurations from wherever you are. Uh, one of the great examples of this, I think, is for... Um, Another project that I've worked on, which involves very cast, very fast cars driving around very big tracks. Um, all of that system was connected via an IP system and the broadcast team sitting in Cologne were able to see every bit of equipment on the racetrack in Melbourne. 
So before a guy on site would even notice that there's a problem, they could get a phone call from the control center in Cologne and saying, hey, go out to turn three. Uh, I think there's a problem there. The microphone's not sending me any signal. And it's not, I can't get a signal or, you know, what's going on here. They can say, right, just check it here. I can see that the box is on, it's got power, uh, phantom power's on, but the mic's not working. So it's probably the mic cable or something like that. So there's, there's a, a lot, you can get yourself up and running faster and your ability to fault find becomes insanely fast from a long distance. Uh, another one that I've worked on here, and this is from Chiba in Japan, these are high-speed IP links, so it's not your standard Wi-Fi. Uh, they were able to beam to the airport um, 10 kilometers away from the, the racetrack. Uh, again, can't really mention the, the project, but you should be able to guess from that. So it was carrying live broadcast video to and from the airport back to the racetrack. Uh, it was carrying all the audio into common such, and it got to the point where we didn't have to have anyone at the airport or maybe have just one, uh, let's call it duty technician rather than a, a specialist because the control room there could see everything that was going on. They could see if there's any sync problems or, or uh, broken cables or anything else from 10 kilometers away. Now, that drive would have been an extra half an hour or 40 minutes or so if there was a problem normally, which means get in the car, drive around, find it, troubleshoot it, make a phone call, make sure it works and then come back. Uh, but now it's all able to be done over the, um, over the network. So, Next steps, how can you go out and become an IP pro? What I wanted to do is throw up some resources here and I will, um, I'll live in there for a second. And I believe that you'll be able to see this on the YouTube link. And I think that the um, materials might be able to be downloaded later. Uh, but Harman, we have got hundreds now of these webinars. Some of them do take that deeper dive into these topics. So if you wanna go through those lists there, there's also a lot of uh, prepackaged content around topics like Dante or Blue Link uh, or these other areas. So you can go through and um, learn about those. Um, another couple of areas I'd like to really point out is Ordinate uh, does a lot of similar things. Ordinate uh, are the people who make Dante. They have a lot of training resources online and they do run sessions as well. So that's a good place to go check out if you're interested in audio over IP. Similarly, Ross Video. Um, Ross is a video manufacturer for broadcasting. They're very popular in um, esports as well now. They have a similar knowledge center and this leans more towards the uh, broadcast video standards like CD2110. And then the other one that I do, I do enjoy uh, is, is AIMS. So AIMS is an alliance of broadcast manufacturers and customers uh, that have said, hey, you know what, we should all get together and say, this is going to be the standard that we all agree on. And that's been SMPTE 2110. Um, again, just mentioning that is like uh, opening the Pandora's box when it comes to, to details. But 2110 is the standard that uh, is becoming um, very popular in broadcast. So if this kind of whets your appetite and you want to go on through things, um, here's the things that I would do is firstly, if you try and find any interrupts or plug fests that are in your area um, and, and just go and attend it. A plug fest is usually where manufacturers or integrators or customers can get together. Someone sets up a network and you just plug your different signals in there and try experiments. Like, can I get from my Soundcraft mixer to my uh, QSC amplifiers? You know, if you're, if you wanted to do that or vice versa. Um, you also find that that's where the IP gurus tend to gather and they will share, share their ideas there. Um, and it's, it's really, it's a good place to kind of meet people as well. So that's great fun. And then I would also say, spend a bit of time looking at the different standards. I think I mentioned briefly Dante. This is the most popular uh, standard or protocol in the audio space right now, but there are a few others. There's AS67 and this is a, open standard, it's a more open standard available to all manufacturers, whereas Dante is made by um, Ordinate. SMPTE 2110 is the broadcast standard now. It actually includes AES67 as the audio component of that, but it does have a much broader scope as well. It does look into data and uh, subtitle data and such there as well. AVB, and I think I did see a, a question about AVB, so I'll come back to that shortly. AVB is a is an IEEE standard. Now, the IEEE are the people who make the internet and electricity work, uh, so it's a bit small, uh, it's a bit lower level in terms of OSI level, uh, but it is a bit, uh, it's, it's very robust, but it does have a lot of um, requirements around it. Another one that's going to become increasingly important, especially um, as we go into the future, is IEEE 1588 also known as Precision Time Protocol or PTP. 
Um, anyone who has worked in a digital system will know that you need to synchronize everything together. Um, that used to be called the word clock in digital. Um, now it's called PTP. So if you need to get a really good understanding of that. And then down the bottom, we have a few of the compressed video signals, um, H.264, H.265. These are video compression methods um, that you see quite often in AV applications. And then JPEG 2K or J, you know, sorry, JPEG 2000 or J2K, uh, which is another compressed video standard, but more popular with broadcasters uh, for a number of reasons there. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to go back to the resource slide here and leave that up if anyone wants to copy that down. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's my brief spiel. It was very quick. I know that uh, again, trying to do dolphin dives through a lot of deep topics. Um, but uh, hopefully you found that interesting. And uh, I think we've got time for questions now. Hey, Cameron, that was fantastic, man. Like you said, it's probably something you could talk about uh, for an entire day. So it's hard to cram into a, a short 45 um, minute window. We do have a couple questions here. Um, first one, uh, you mentioned the AVB. Said I would be interested, the question is, I would be interested to know whether HiQnet, Blue Link, or other Harman technologies are in, are interoperable with AVB, Dante, or other multi-vendor solutions. Yeah, and the the quick answer to that is yes. <laughs> but I think one thing to to note is that um, HiQnet is a control system, so it's an Ethernet based thing. But this is now not talking about moving signals from point A to B. This is uh, how do you control your amplifiers? So HiQnet will exist with most of these other protocols. So that's a that's a relatively easy one. Um, Blue Link is not actually an Ethernet protocol. It's not an IP protocol. So I think I mentioned it earlier in the slide. It is a digital protocol that just happens to use an Ethernet cable. So I can't get a Blue, Net, Blue Link device and plug it into an Ethernet switch and expect it to work. Uh, the good thing is, though, as you mentioned, that it's, there's um, converter boxes. So I think it's called the Blue Dan. We'll take a Blue Link signal and convert it into Dante or Dante into Blue Link and back again. Uh, but when we talk about AVB, Dante, and AS67, uh, the main thing we do is Dante. So we do Dante because it does actually have an AES67 mode, which we spoke about before then. So it will connect to the vast majority of other uh, manufacturers equipment. And there's a lot of devices that we have there. So uh, the DSI DA series, which is the amplifiers from Crown, the 806 Blue, London Blue will connect to that as well. And then the, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the Blue Dan, B-L-U-D-A-N, uh, which is the converter between Blue Link and Dante. We do have some AVB products. I, I forgot the model number. I think it's the Blue 805. But AVB fell out of fashion probably about three or four years ago, maybe longer, because you need to have a specific switch. Uh, Dante, AS67, Simpty2110 have some requirements for switches, uh, but they're definitely not as strict as AVB. If you have an A, unless you have an AVB switch, your network will not work. Uh, and that's why it's limited to um, like small studio applications or live applications where everyone is using um, the, the uh, AVB standard. Hey, Cameron, you had mentioned a little bit about the, in the myths, the, the investment, the costs of digital versus analog. Could you dive into that maybe a little bit more and, and why, you know, digital or, or IP might not be as um, intimidating as was it might as what it might sounds financially. Yeah, let me let me just uh, where did I, where did I put it here? We go. Analog systems are cheaper, and I think I have seen and don't get me wrong. I have seen some installations that are insanely more expensive um, than if they had just done them with analog or, or baseband, which is basically analog or digital with normal cables. Uh, there was a broadcast center in Luxembourg that was so paranoid about their redundancy and uh, their system being online that they actually installed two networks from two different manufacturers uh, to completely mitigate any kind of, of disruption to their signal. But of course, that ballooned the cost to an insane amount. Uh, a lot of that was because the design was based around getting the signals back to a core router where they usually use them and then back out to the endpoints rather than using the network as a router itself. And that's really the key, um, the key differentiation in saving cost here is 
taking out parts of the old system, like a big video router or a big audio router or a big patch panel and replacing that now with switches. Once you do that and think about uh, the way you're designing your system, you can actually get that uh, pretty significant reduction in cost. Are the, uh, are the protocols fairly universal across the globe from region to region? Yeah, absolutely. So if we, if I, there you go, if we come back to here, um, Dante, Dante is exactly the same everywhere. And the reason for that is Ordinate makes it. And if you want to have a Dante enabled device, you will have a chip. You basically get this chip and you jam it into your device. And it's almost like having a converter box inside your device. And that means that any other device that's got Dante will definitely work. Um, the other standards, you know, things that are standards. So whenever you see a bit of alphabet soup before something like AES or SMPD or you know, IEEE, uh, that generally means that there is a standards body somewhere that has said, here are the rules that you have to follow. So if you want to play in the SMPD 2110 game, here are the rules that you have to follow. And in theory, they will talk to other devices that have got the same rules. Now, the difference is less about regions, like, you know, is it 100 volt versus 200 volt? It's more about manufacturers and what they let you change, um, which is a whole, again, other topic. Uh, but that's the kind of thing you see at a plug fest. You'll see a lot of engineers scratching their heads and then try to call up the software developers to get a, a new text field added to their <laughs> control software. Maybe, uh, maybe that's your next session. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When uh, when you're look when you're looking down the line in the into the future, you know, do you, do you see the transition a, away from analog becoming? Is it starting to gain momentum, or is it roughly the same as it's been in the in the last five years? Where do you see the the, the market, um, or I guess the need in 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 the short future? Yeah, no, that's that's a really interesting question because I spent a lot of time in the broadcast industry with Riedel and. Uh, at that time, about five or six years ago, we were saying, oh, the AV industry is so far ahead of broadcast and broadcast will take forever to get there. It'll take about four or five years. Um, and then in that space, pretty much every broadcast installation these days is doing something in the IP sphere on the content creation side. Um, now, moving across back to AV, we hear the other things like, oh, broadcast is so far ahead of us. It'll take five or six years. Uh, and as you can see, the example there from, from that big white pointy building was 2012, um, that that was all finished. Uh, so we've been there for a while, but what you're probably going to see is it's going to be that switch between the, the people that have got the ability to do something and do it because it's fun, like a certain myself, um, and the mainstream doing this. And I think you'll see that that's going to switch in the next couple of years uh, because of the maturity of higher speed standards, um, with your switches. You know, it's now very uncommon to find a switch that's not capable of a gigabit or faster. Uh, the maturity of the standards, like the, some of the standards that are on screen here now, like H265, which is a very fast, very small um, video codec, and the deployment of things like AS67, which has allowed manufacturers to start really investing into that. The customers want it, which becomes this feedback cycle, which really accelerates things. So yeah, I would not be surprised if like in the digital world, like again, it started about 2000 and it wasn't until about 2006, seven where it became the norm. Now we're kind of really, let's call it quote unquote starting here. And in five to six years, if uh, it becomes the norm, I would not be surprised. Interesting, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that's all the questions we have for you today. Cameron, definitely wanna thank you for your time and for this awesome session. It's extremely interesting. Um, we want to thank also all the present, all the attendees who joined, who joined this presentation. Thank you for, for joining us today and for the questions. Please remember that the recorded version of this webinar will be available on our Harmon training portal here in the next few days. So definitely be on the lookout for that. And also make sure to take a look at all of our upcoming sessions on audio, video, lighting, and control that will be taking place over the next few months. For Harmon, I want to thank you guys again for joining us, Cameron, for your time, and want to wish everybody a great rest of the day. Thanks again.